Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this second session. If you look at the panel, you will see it's, first of all, immensely distinguished. You'll secondly see people on it who actually played a part in the fall of the Soviet Union and of communism 25 years ago. Um, uh, Radek Sikorski, who is now, of course, uh, Poland's distinguished foreign minister, was at that time a journalist uh, working for my own magazine, as a matter of fact, uh, covering the Velvet Revolutions. Um, Charles Pohl uh, was Mrs. Thatcher's right-hand advisor on foreign policy, and so on and so forth. And if we look back on those days, and we then compare the optimism uh, following the end of communism and the rebirth of a much more free society around the world, we can say two things, I think. First of all, that for 15 or 20 years, uh, that promise of uh, greater freedom was fulfilled. Um, to take the most vivid example, um, about two billion workers in Asia moved from abject poverty to entering the world labor market and forging what is now a gr large and growing Chinese middle class. Um, but we can also see, if we watch this morning's news, any number of armed conflicts going around in the world, taking place, destroying lives, and destroying stability, in which the West seems to have, um, at best, a marginal role and sometimes no role at all. And we have seen since the high watermark of uh, West dominance, which one might say, for example, was the uh, fall of the statue of Saddam in the um, Second Gulf War, we've seen since then a gradual retreat uh, from Western power and influence and the emergence of not only of other powers, but of other groups which are not powers um, operating by any kind of international rule, but terrorist groups uh, playing a, a role we never expected such groups to play. So um, things have changed, first for the better, secondly, apparently for the worst, and we are faced with the question of the panel today, has the West gone soft? I'm going to begin this panel by asking um, Radek Sikorsky uh, to, uh, to uh, tell us what his view of the current situation is because, after all, he has taken the lead in the European Union's and uh, NATO's uh, dealings um, over Ukraine um, and he has provided um, very strong leadership for a West which initially seemed uncertain and divided, and is still not wholly united, but nonetheless seems to be acting with somewhat greater dispatch. So has the West gone soft? Um, if it has, can it recover its backbone and spine? Uh, Radek Sikorsky. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to be led by John O'Sullivan again. I um, greatly enjoyed um, my time as um, Chief Correspondent for National Review. In fact, I met Lady Thatcher in person for the first time uh, at John O'Sullivan's um, farewell party in the gardens of number 10, uh, which Lady Thatcher, with typical generosity, uh, uh, organized for John's departure to New York. Um, well, thank you for your hospitality uh, in, in this wonderful um, venue. And it's always good to be back among friends. I'd like to start by taking you back to 1982, which, at which time Mrs. Thatcher was just um, getting in her stride. But for us, those were the dark days of martial law. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher spoke out to and on behalf of the Polish people when they couldn't do it uh, on their own because their government was not uh, representing them. The government we had was Soviet-imposed. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, at what, what they said. There's a spirit of solidarity abroad in the world today that no physical force can crush. It crosses national boundaries and enters into the hearts of men and women everywhere. In factories, farms, and schools, in cities and towns around the globe, we, the people of the free world, stand as one with our Polish brothers and sisters. Poland has a special place in British history and in British hearts. My generation will never forget that Poland was Britain's ally from first to last in the Second World War. 
Polish squadrons flew with ours in the Battle of Britain. Polish soldiers fought with ours at Monte Cassino in Italy. Polish sailors died with ours to keep open the Atlantic lifeline from America. Now again, we're inspired by the people of Poland. Their longing and their struggle for freedom have kindled new hope in their country and all over Eastern Europe. More than that, they've reminded us in the West of the precious quality of our own freedom. They, who know what it's like to live without it. And let me just assure you, in Central Europe, we have long memories and we remember who are our friends in need. Uh, we know how the story ended with our victory and communism's collapse. And I was very uh, lucky to be able to see Mrs. Acha again, this time as a prepubescent deputy defense minister in 1992. The Cold War had ended but Soviet troops were still in Poland. Uh, and we spoke about the strategic choices for Poland and the UK in the new situation. You won't be surprised to hear that Mrs. Thatcher spoke with some passion. She showed me the power of her mind and the breadth and kindness of her generosity. She, she cooked me lunch. Um, <clears throat> she talked about consolidating for decades to come, our unprecedented ideological victory over communism in Central and Eastern Europe. And she gave me this note uh, to mark her support for our efforts. Can you read it? Basically, it's, it says that um, she supports the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Poland and the inclusion of Poland in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization as soon as possible, which in 1992, uh, as you can see the date, was still a bold, uh, typically bold um, view to hold. We didn't make it into NATO until um, seven years later, in fact. So you can appreciate that to us, Margaret Thatcher was one of the holy trinity of international leaders. Pope John Paul II, Ronald Reagan, and herself, who helped end communism in Europe. Like Reagan and Pope John Paul, she believed that a free society is a moral value. Under communism, we Poles were taught by the relentless propaganda that it takes enforced altruism to build a prosperous, patriotic society. Margaret Thatcher said loud and clear what we all knew in our hearts to be true, namely that prosperity and patriotism aren't imposed, that people who receive most of the fruits of their labor will work hard for their family and community and their country, that enforced altruism is not altruism at all, it is slavery. Poland's first finance minister after communism was Leszek Balcerowicz. Last month in New York, he received the Decatur Institute's Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty. Leszek understands the force of Margaret Thatcher's boldness and steely discipline. And he knows that when you get the policy mix right and stick to it, the benefits compound he opted for a shock therapy reform package. On the 1st of, of January 1990, we introduced 13 laws that, that instituted free market in Poland. It hurt, but it worked. And since then, Poland has surged ahead from other post-communist -communi transition countries. We now are one of Europe's healthiest and fastest growing economies. Polish initiative, hard work, and discipline are paying off. We are enjoying the legacy of Margaret Thatcher's ideas, a great surge in liberty and human dignity and prosperity around the world. Here in Europe, and I have to say that our starting point was different, so perhaps we perceive it differently from, from you in Britain, but 
in Poland, we see Europe as a single market that brings together 28 countries to, to create integration based on common interests. The single market, we believe, is one of Margaret Thatcher's greatest achievements. Let's be honest, she was not a, a fan of every aspect of the European Union's institutional framework, to say the least. Nor am I. And we believe that the EU is imperfect, but it's the only one we've got. I represent a country with some of the strongest pro-Europe ratings among voters anywhere in the European Union. In fact, recently, uh, these ratings have touched, and some of, for some of you it may be a shock, but here it is, the 89% appro approval of the EU in Poland recently. Even so, we in Poland also have people who are skeptical and who complain that Poland's, Poland is giving in to orders from Brussels. Well, I try to explain to them that we should look at what we have right now. And first of all, it's better than what we used to have uh, under communism, but it's more than that. You want the benefits coming from single markets? That's, this means rules agreed by member states sharing and pooling sovereignty. This in turn means an effective EU structure to give those rules authority and enforcement. We simply cannot do away with something like that. Eurosceptics also want, sometimes at least, a robust foreign policy to pursue uh, at least their own country's national interests. You don't mind joining hands with friendly partners to, to, to maximize the impact of, of such policies. But we also want the flexibility to work in smaller teams. Well, I would argue this is exactly what we have right now in the European Union and NATO. In Iran, Catherine Ashton led the, led the EU's common policy, supporting ministers from France, Britain, and Germany, working closely with the United States, China, and Russia. You don't need to persuade us Poles that questions of sovereignty do matter. But are we really abandoning freedom of choice and national independence in exchange for diktats from Brussels bureaucrats? We don't feel it. Look at the Libya intervention or the operation in Mali. Some EU countries got engaged, others stayed back. The point is this, the EU offers a good framework for countries to, sh to share foreign policy resources while keeping open independent options when their national interests are at stake. What's not to like about this two-pronged approach? It gives EU member states the best of both worlds, bilateral energy, insight and influence combined with the collective diplomatic resources of the Union as a whole. The world is a tough place, and I think in the last few months is getting considerably tougher. We have an arc of instability from Central African Republic through Mali, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Caucasus, and now Ukraine, both neighbors, neighborhoods of the EU are uh, destabilized. Russia's annexation of Crimea compels us to confront two uncomfortable truths. Namely that a full 25 years after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, tens of millions of Europeans are still struggling to find their rightful place in the democratic family of nations and that even in today's peaceful Europe, we have leaders who defy basic rules. For the first time since the Second World War, one European country has taken a province by force from another European country. And it continues uh, with, with subversion in Eastern Ukraine, which actually reminds me of an anecdote from the old days. <clears throat> 
we, uh, that we used to tell in communist Poland. Because in those days, there were, there were people in the West arguing that uh, it's understandable for, for Russia to have, for the Soviet Union to have satellites in Central Europe, which is to say to keep us subjugated because Russia has such uh, uncertain borders and Russia uh, needs to feel secure in its borders. Well, the anecdote went like this. What is a secure border of the Soviet Union? A secure border of the Soviet Union is a border that has Soviet soldiers on both sides of it. <laughs> Can Britain, France, Germany and Poland and or any other country acting alone uh, uh, respond meaningfully to either Russian aggression or to Iran's nuclear program? I don't think so. I think there is a case for collective action uh, with Europe. Uh, and whereas we may have disagreed with Mrs. Thatcher on this essential point, I think today she would see that um, we need to stand up united to the challenges uh, that face us. Um, and um, we just, I just feel that Europe needs to share, to use its shared weight, slowly but surely, to help Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, and eventually Russia to find their way to stable pluralist societies. It's not spectacular, but it works in the long run, and it is not soft. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have four more very distinguished speakers, but only about half an hour in which they're able to speak. So I'm going to have to ask them if they would be kind enough to try to keep their remarks of five, six, seven minutes. And secondly, I'm going to truncate my introductions as well. And I'm going to say about the next speaker, Tavi Roivas, who is the youngest uh, prime minister of, uh, in the European Union, the Prime Minister of Estonia, uh, that, uh, that in addition to being the youngest, he is the Prime Minister of one of the most remarkable success stories of the post-communist world. Estonia has recovered twice from two disasters. The first was communism, and the second was the impact of the financial crisis of 2008. And it's done so by extraordinarily bold reform policies, which trace directly, I think, to Mrs. Thatcher's vision, as indeed um, several of, of um, Estonia's leaders have said. So it's with great pleasure that I invite um, uh, Mr. Roivas to address us. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when um, Radek was telling all the personal stories, when he had met um, Lady Thatcher, it made me jealous. I don't, unfortunately, have any possibilities to tell similar stories. But on the other hand, I probably belong to this, this um, generation that has been affected most by Lady Thatcher's uh, legacy. We are talking about um, the 25 years, and these 25 years have been beautiful years. If Putin has said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe, I would say, on the contrary, the collapse of Soviet Union, and um, Radek Sikorsky very rightfully said, with the big help of um, the Western allies, it was the best thing to happen during the 20th century. The 25 years um, have brought us EU and NATO enlargement, have brought us um, single market, economic prosperity. We felt that it has brought us more security than ever before. But in this context, uh, we were not 100% correct. 
I hope that um, things will change. And when we celebrate the 50th birthday or anniversary of um, the fall of um, Berlin Wall, we can say that the security in Europe is stronger than ever. Why I say that today we have not achieved the security goals completely, even though that we have very strong military, political union, NATO, much more countries uh, being part of NATO than before, is that right beside us is a terrible imperialistic ambition and uh, everybody su was surprised that not far from Poland, not far from other EU countries, close to EU border, Crimea was annexed. Everybody was surprised. Should, should we have been surprised? I come back to 2008. Uh, 2008, in Georgia, we saw a slightly different approach, but similar ambition. And the worrying thing was everybody pressed the snooze button on a very alarming alarm bell. The alarm bell went off very strongly and snooze button was pressed very soon. And people went back to business as usual and then were surprised when similar things happened in, in Crimea and now in eastern Ukraine. So I really hope that this time we listen to this alarm bell and, and we really stay awake. Well, first of all, I want to just um, give a couple of comments how I think this is possible. Of course, you can uh, accuse uh, Ukraine and say that they didn't take a uh, European path and uh, didn't have enough reforms and thus it was possible to, to attack them because they are weak and some part of it is probably true. Some part of it is true because uh, I couldn't imagine in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania or Poland the possibility of um, telling anyone that we will raise your pension to Russian level and this would be considered a positive news. In Crimea, the levels of pensions and salaries were half of the level of Russia. In Estonia and Poland, they are double almost of, of the level of Russia. But this is not the only thing. Estonians, Poles, many others enjoy freedoms of European Union and also Russian speakers living in our countries, living in Lithuania, living in Latvia, do understand that uh, being part of uh, the Western world is actually beneficial and, and nobody in Estonia wants to be rescued by anyone from the East. But secondly, I don't think that uh, the blame is on Ukraine. I don't believe that anyone seriously believes that green men, peaceful inhabitants, peaceful people of Slovyansk, all of the sudden thought that let's go to the shop and buy the latest Spetsnazi equipment and start messing around with that. Do you actually believe that? Now we see also tanks in the streets uh, that come clearly from um, east of Ukraine, which were the, across the eastern border, which means they can only come from Russia. Um, the scenarios of, of little green men have been um, exercised in the past, and, and Estonia also has similar memories already from the year 1924. But I think uh, something we should keep in mind is that this is not peaceful up uprisal of local people who are unsatisfied with the life in Ukraine. This is clear invasion and, and this should be uh, dealt accordingly. The biggest worry, I think, uh, why some say that Europe is um, 
acting less than it should uh, and why, why they are accusing Europe is probably because um, Europe's ab ability to act is limited to by dependency. And by dependency, of course, first of all, I mean energy dependency. Uh, a couple of months ago, I think it was about two months ago, The Economist uh, published a map showing which European countries are most dependent on uh, the gas that is coming only from Russia. Uh, actually, the real picture is even worse because many of the countries who theoretically are affected 50% cannot actually allow themselves forgetting this 50%. So their dependence is actually also there. And being dependent on any single resource isn't economically wise and dependence isn't, uh, of course, um, giving you a strong position, which is uh, rather certain. But the good, good thing in this is that uh, we have to keep in mind that the dependence is mutual. Russia depends on Europe even more. 60% of uh, Russian uh, budget is actually consisting of, uh, of incomes related to gas or oil. And uh, while we keep that in mind, while we keep in mind that we actually do have potential to decrease our dependency on the gas, uh, then we understand that in, in the five years' time, we can be in totally different security situation in Europe, and we can, if we act, we can be optimistic about the future. Um, I think uh, we can build uh, sustainable sources uh, of, um, of uh, LNG also with uh, more free trade with the United States and, and um, so on. And the second dependence, what I think Europe has, uh, and this dependency is, is limiting our economic growth potential. And this dependency is the dependence on sovereign debt. Not perhaps the first thing linked to security, but I really think that as long as we have enjoyed uh, the borrowed money in order to keep our things running, uh, we do understand that we cannot continue this forever. And this actually means that, um, that this limits our potential to act in the future almost as much as energy dependence. So, to conclude, what can we do in order to be clear, vocal, in at least five years' time? We should increase energy independence. We should tr uh, dramatically increase uh, energy independence, I would even say. We should get our uh, financial house in order. We should have more single market uh, within EU in order to have sustainable economic development. And of course, um, I don't even come to mention uh, building defense capabilities. It's rather clear, I, I believe, to everyone today that um, if we don't have a visible deterrence, Europe won't be a peaceful place forever. So in order to not have military attacks on European countries, we should build deterrence. And I will finish my remarks by saying that uh, we still need the determination of uh, Lady Margaret Thatcher. This is still very much needed in Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker, Charles Powell, has had a distinguished career as an international businessman and as an independent member of the House of Lords since he left Downing Street. But in the context of today's discussion, he is, of course, the man who, for uh, m most of her period in office, was Mrs. Thatcher's principal foreign policy advisor in Downing Street. Um, Mrs. Thatcher famously said, in another context, um, advisers advise and ministers decide, which of course is true. But having said that, I don't think anyone who was there at the time doubted that there were very few occasions of a major kind when Mrs. Thatcher rejected Charles's advice, and as such, therefore, he was one of the people 
one of the leading figures who helped to bring about the end of communism peacefully and ushered in a safer world. Now that uh, this world is less safe, I think it, it, it behoves us to uh, listen to his advice again on what we should be doing. Charles Powell. Well, <clears throat> John, thank you very much. I've heard of the policeman getting younger, but this is ridiculous. Uh, I'm glad that Raddick uh, had his lunch cooked by Mrs. Thatcher. I can tell you exactly what it was. The only thing she ever cooked for lunch, it was shepherd's pie. And I'm entering the Guinness Book of Records myself as the world's greatest consumer of shepherd's pie over many, many years. I think both our first two speakers demonstrate very clearly, better than any of the rest of us can do, the importance of a foreign policy based on extending liberty. They are the very evidence of that policy and the success of that policy. But of course, when we look at the question of are we going soft, this very great guild hall gives us a message. I was looking at the inscription under the statue of Pitt the Younger over there this morning, and it re recalls that his aim in foreign policy was to to animate others by the example of Great Britain. Well, I think Margaret Thatcher would probably have subscribed to that too. Could we do so today? I rather doubt it. It also says, by the way, that William, Smith, William Pitt aspired to resist the aims of France, which were directed against the independence of every government and people. Now, if one just substituted the word EU for France, I think probably, again, it would be a rather Thatcherite policy. But on our theme of have we gone soft, I would start by just distinguishing two elements. First, what I would call the unavoidable, which I think is the decline in our relative power and capability as other nations rise. And second, the wholly avoidable decline in our willpower, backbone, and willingness as a nation and a group of nations, the West, to give a lead. Now, the end of the Cold War was always going to be a watershed in terms of people's perception of the threat to our interests and our way of life. The whole context of foreign policy, the whole context of politics changed with the, uh, the end of the Cold War. And I do sometimes doubt whether even Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher could have performed the role they played in the 1980s and 90s in the modern world. Of course, the need for their values, their principles, their leadership would be as great as ever, but the stage on which they would have to perform would be a very different one, and I'm not sure whether everything they did in their time could achieve the same resonance today. And indeed, I quite often ask myself how Margaret Thatcher would have done, would have performed in various post-Cold War situations had she still been Prime Minister. Well, on the Balkans, she woke up far earlier, far earlier than any other Western government for the need for intervention against Serbia. Uh, so she was clearly on record on that. I'm frankly not sure whether she would have taken Britain into a second Iraq war. I suspect she would have on the same basis as she supported President Reagan's bombing of Libya. In her own words, that's what allies are for. But it would have been a much more limited aim of replacing Saddam and getting out promptly. Margaret Thatcher was interested in victories, not in nation building. I think she would have supported the Libya intervention, and I'm sure she would have supported retribution against Syria. But on Ukraine, I doubt she would have done more or less than is being done now. One only has to think back to her harping on the sanctity of contracts when the United States imposed sanctions on the Soviet Union following the invasion of Afghanistan. And that, for me, illustrates her capacity to strike a balance between our capabilities and our national interests on the one hand and the willpower to do what is difficult but necessary on the other. Now, I think the accusation that the West has gone soft is arguable up until quite recently, but has very recently become no longer arguable. And for me, Syria, what happened over Syria, was really was a, a, 
a, a, a transitional moment, a test case. First of all, failing, failing to arm the moderate opposition in, to Assad was a huge mistake. Setting a red line about Syria and the use of chemical weapons, and then just melting away when the Syrians crossed that red line was, for me, a calamitous misstep, which is going to have consequences far in the future and far beyond Syria itself. No one was proposing to invade Syria. No one's mad. Uh, but I recall sitting in the Lords and listening to the debate in which fully 80% of the speakers were against intervention of any sort in Syria and thinking, this is just like the Oxford Union in 1933 and the resolution that this House would not fight for king and country. Now, why has the West gone soft? There are some very obvious reasons. It's always hard to galvanize democracies after a great war or a great conflict, and the end of the Cold War was no exception. People relaxed. They, they enjoyed the peace they felt they had earned. Secondly, I think there has been a sense of entrapment and a sense of failure over Iraq and Afghanistan, and the effect of that has been to make the West generally much more risk averse. I would say third, that our economic success up until 2007 and 8 gave a sense that the democratic market economy model was ineffably superior and would ensure continued Western dominance without the need for the more obvious manifestations of hard power. But more important than any of that, the ability to convey a sense of the West's destiny to lead in world affairs seems to me to have evaporated. And in the UK and Europe as a whole, we just lack a foreign policy strategy, a clear sense of direction. We proceed instead by fits and starts on a case-by-case -case basis with very few all-embracing aims. There's none of the passion, there's none of the moral sense which inspired foreign policy in the time of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. We aren't, I have to say. I really feel we are not driven by a desire any longer to see freedom triumph. We can't articulate well the need to respond to challenges. And as a result, we can't call forth the sacrifices which have to be made if our global interests are to be advanced. Is it just a question of being in a different age? It probably was easier in the Cold War context to have a strategy. Many will remember President Reagan's response on coming to office and being handed a huge file and being told this was his national security strategy. He handed it back and said, thank you, I don't need it. I have a strategy and it's simple. We win, they lose. Um, and indeed, I think one of, the great <laughs> one of the great strengths of both President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher was the ability to encapsulate important thoughts in very crisp sentences. I was reminded the other day of someone who asked Margaret Thatcher uh, how she defined leadership. Easy. I tell them what to do and they do it. <laughs> but there are two other more specific explanations, I think, for going soft. The first is creeping legalism and inquiry-itis. I think they are strangling initiative and acceptable risk-taking. And they're both symptomatic of the executive in this country and elsewhere in Europe losing confidence to stand up to power grabs by some parts of the judiciary and to some extent the back benches. And I see absolutely no reason why either group is better placed than government to judge when it's necessary to act. And the second for me is the false doctrine of soft power of which the European Union is high priest. The European Union glories in soft power as a substitute for hard power, but it just doesn't work like that. Soft power cannot be effective without hard power to back it up. And the most obvious example of this is Europe's almost negligible defence spending, with the modest exception of Britain and France. But it goes beyond that to the sort of agonising we've seen about even the most modest steps of sanctions against Russia for its seizure of Ukraine. Are we paying a high price for going soft? Long term, it's going to be a heavy price because our rivals, our competitors, those who resent the West's global role and don't share its values and commitment to freedom will be encouraged 
by our perceived loss of will to push their luck and challenge our interests. One's seen it already with President Putin in Ukraine and before that with Georgia. One sees it with the Chinese in the South China Sea and their evident determination to push the United States out of Asia back into the mid-Pacific. And the risk is that China and Russia will again come together to close the West out. And I must say, I do give full credit to the United States for recognizing that danger and having its tilt towards Asia, its pivot towards Asia. Are there things we should have done differently? Yes, we should have taken action on Syria, as I've said. Yes, we should regard the 1991 commitment not to station NATO forces in Eastern Europe as a dead letter now following Russia's seizure of Crimea. Yes, we should be re ready to contemplate some limited action in the support of the United States, if it so decides, against the extremist um, rebels in Iraq. Last point is that weakness and softness are self-reinforcing. It seems that rebuilding our hard power capabilities is nearly beyond us. But we do need to try to rebuild our willpower. We need to be honest with people about the long-term risk of losing ground to rising powers which failure to invest in hard power capabilities will entail. Is that going to happen? I'm afraid I doubt it. Thank you. Neil, Neil Ferguson is a historian and biographer. He's held a series of distinguished academic positions at Oxford, at NYU, and at Harvard. He's written histories ranging on topics ranging from the First World War to the British Empire. Um, and on top of all this, he recently received an award for lifetime achievement, even though I guess he's not even reached the halfway mark yet. So I'd like on your behalf to invite Neil to um, address us. Thank you, John. It's a huge pleasure to be here. I was a foot soldier, or perhaps spear carrier, in the Thatcher Revolution, and therefore in the Cold War. What that meant was writing leaders for the Telegraph and op-eds from Berlin. In the summer of 1989, I wrote a piece predicting that the Berlin Wall was crumbling. It never appeared. It was spiked by a deputy editor who said I'd been listening to too many Ronald Reagan speeches. I was a foot soldier because of a very few academics uh, who held out against the left liberal tide in Oxford and Cambridge and encouraged me and others to go and see what Soviet rule was like for ourselves. And it's appropriate, I think, to pay tribute to the Thatcherite dons who did so much to keep the spirit of liberty alive in British universities when it threatened to be snuffed out. Norman Stone, Jeremy Catto, Morris Cowling, Roger Scruton. They were more than just spear carriers. They were the spears, the intellectual spears of Thatcherism. And they won. We won. Victory in the Cold War was surely the great achievement of what people sneeringly called the new right. The interesting thing from a historian's vantage point is that Margaret Thatcher's contribution to that victory was not just based on ideological rigor. Yes, she was unflinching in her response to Soviet aggression, unflinching in her response to all aggression from the Falklands to Iraq and Kuwait. But she was also a pragmatist. She was in many ways a realist on foreign policy issues, on Europe, as Radek reminds us. In power, she was a pragmatist. On South Africa, on Hong Kong, she often was far more of a realist than we spear carriers found entirely comfortable. And that is an important point to which I will revert momentarily. 
25 years on, where are we? If by the West we mean what Sam Huntington meant, which was essentially Western Europe plus the Anglosphere plus Israel, Judeo-Christian civilization under American leadership, it's obvious the West has been in steep decline since the victory of 1989, not only demographically, but economically in terms of gross domestic product, but also in terms of our economic legitimacy in the wake of the financial crisis and all the abuses that that crisis exposed, not least the monopolistic tendencies that, that Morisacci has so rightly highlighted in his new proposal. And the West is in geopolitical decline. NATO is not a credible force. That is the reality, not just of the Crimean crisis, but also, it seems to me, of a wider crisis of European defence policy. And we are in cultural decline, too. In all those four respects, we must face the fact that in the wake of victory came a serious decline of the West, even a division of the West. China, who would have predicted in 1989 that by the year 2014, on at least one measure, China's would be the biggest economy in the world, and still under the leadership of a single communist party. What a defeat, an unlooked for defeat 25 years back. Think also of the threat posed by a resurgent Russia, which certainly in 1991 few of us would have anticipated. Imagine how Margaret Thatcher would have responded to the fiascos that we have seen in Syria and with respect to Ukraine. Think also of the fundamental challenge posed to the West by the fundamental structural crisis of the European Union. Now, I'm sure there are those of differing views from Radek in this room, and they would probably regard me as unsound on this question. I certainly would regard a British exit from the European Union as a profound setback for the West, a weakening of one of those institutions that once was a source of strength. But if the British voter is confronted with a choice between exit and being a part of a German-led federal state, what Angela Merkel calls openly Bundesrepublik Europa, could you really blame voters for opting for the exit? Fourthly, the challenge to the West that is cultural is the challenge that no one has yet mentioned, and that is the challenge posed by radical Islam, which seems to me, in many ways, the most serious challenge that the West faces today. Once seen as an ally in the struggle against the Soviets, it has now become the most rapidly growing threat to Western values in the world today. And I want to conclude these brief remarks by reflecting on what Margaret Thatcher would have made of these four challenges that we face from the economic to the cultural. Part of Margaret Thatcher's role was to stop the leaders of the West, American presidents, from going wobbly. And I have often felt that in the face of the wobbliest president of modern times, she would have had her work cut out for her. I believe Margaret Thatcher's response to the extraordinary rise of China would have been engagement, to seize the economic opportunities represented by China's embrace of the market, but not to tip over into appeasement, and least of all, at the expense of a loyal ally in Japan. In response to the threat of a resurgent Russia, I have no doubt that she would have striven to make NATO a more effective force and egged on President Obama to make use of NATO to resist the land grab by Putin and to make the red line a real one. Thirdly, I think Margaret Thatcher 
were she with us today, would be fighting hard to prevent British voters having to make that awful choice between exit or membership of a federal state. She would have wanted, I think, to keep alive the spirit that informed the single European Act, a spirit of European Union as primarily a union based on the free market and not on federalism. Finally, surely she would have seen the vital strategic importance to the West of making some effective stand against the spread of radical Islam. When you reflect on the real lessons of 1989, they seem to me to be these, that the victory of you, Radic, and all like you who stood for freedom in the 1980s, who fled their own countries or suffered internal exile, your victory was based in part on long-standing Western support for your efforts. Have we in our time made comparable efforts to support the dissidents of the Middle East and North Africa, those in that region who stand for freedom? Have we helped them in the way that we helped the opponents of communism? No, we've made scarcely any effort to support their revolution, and not surprisingly, as a result, their revolution failed and was hijacked by the enemies of freedom. That seems to me perhaps the most important lesson that we can learn when we look back on 1989. Margaret Thatcher not only believed in freedom, as a woman who became prime minister, she personified the equality of the sexes, which it is the fundamental mission of radical Islam to undo through the imposition of Sharia law. That is the fight, the fight against that political Islam and its imposition of Sharia law that the foot soldiers of freedom should be fighting today. And I believe it is a fight that Margaret Thatcher, were she with us, would support wholeheartedly. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think Neil, has, Neil Ferguson has already, so to speak, given the introduction for Esperanza Aguirre, and I will simply say that she is a leader of the reform wing of the People's Party, a former minister, the president of the Madrid district, and known in Spain as Spain's Iron Lady. Thank you very much for your introduction. It's for me a great honor to be here this morning. And uh, what I want to say is that uh, the spectacular fall of the communist regimes in 1989 boosted our faith in ourselves. We saw that liberal democracy was morally superior to communist dictatorships. We saw that our freedom was infinitely more efficient in creating wealth and promoting development and prosperity to all citizens. Many of us in the West who were interested in politics thought then that the victory of liberal democracy and the defeat of communism was going to have two positive effects. On the one hand, it would be an effective vaccine against any totalitarian or collectivist temptation. And at the same time, it would serve to stir the free world away from the social democratic paradigm that had been dominating since the end of the Second World War. However, ladies and gentlemen, the experience of the past 25 years, and above all of these last years, shows that our hopes and expectations were over-optimistic. The fact is that totalitarian temptations are still present amongst us, and the acceptance of liberal policies continues to encounter enormous difficulties. And why is this so? This is not an easy question, but allow me to outline some possible explanations. In the first place, the virus of totalitarianism has shown a special skill of mutating, for mutating and emerging under different disguises in Spain, in Europe, and in other countries in the world. 
Islamic fundamentalism, it has been said, is one of these mutations. Another mutation of totalitarianism is populism that is succeeding in some Latin American countries such as Venezuela, Ecuador, or Bolivia. These populist regimes do not conceal the close relationship with the communist dictatorship of the Castro brothers in Cuba. And this populism has emerged in Spain recently, in the last European elections, with a new party that mixes Venezuela's Bolivarian populism with Marxist ideology. It obtained five seats in the European Parliament. But in addition to this ability of the totalitarian virus to mutate, I think there is another very important reason to explain why the West has gone soft in this past 25 years. And the reason lies, in my opinion, in the educational systems in most Western countries. From 1996 to 1999, under the Prime Minister Arnar, I was the Minister of Education. So I have a first-hand experience of the violence with which the ideological establishment opposed any reform to the dogmas now dominating our educational system. These dogmas are not very different from those dominating education in almost Western countries. Maybe we should mention those countries in the Germanic area, Germany, Austria, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, as exceptions to the rule of the dominating education system in other countries. In my view, these educational dogmas are responsible for the fact that we in the West do not defend, as we should, the values that have ensured our freedom and our prosperity. I refer to the values that Professor Nair Ferguson has studied so well in his book, The Great Degeneration, a book which I suppose most of us have read. In the 1960s, two ideologies emerged in Western school system and proved lethal to the education of responsible citizens committed to defending Western values. One was the ideology that comes from the revolution of 68. The 68ism ideology originated in the student occupied La Sorbonne in May 1968. That 68ism has become more strongly established in our schools than one could, could imagine. The reaction against some excesses of authoritarianism in schools turned out into a reaction against autoritas, against the autoritas of knowledge. And as a result, in our schools, in many schools in the West, in the Western countries, there is little difference between knowing and not knowing, learning and not learning, teaching and not teaching. And the other dominant ideology in our school is the egalitarianism that permeates socialist thinking. I think that British people will have no difficulty understanding what I'm talking about, because it was the Minister of Education with Harold Wilson in 1965, the socialist Anthony Crossland, the first to embrace this theory. Crossland viewed schools as a source of inequality. And that led him to confuse equal opportunities, which in my opinion must be the main objective of any government, with equality of results. Crossland, as many of you know, was the great promoter of the comprehensive schools and the great enemy of the grammar schools that Mrs. Thatcher liked so much. With this, I think you all understand uh, what this ideology was about. And the experience of nearly half a century of comprehensiveness is that students' results have evened out, but at a below average level. And ladies and gentlemen, to sum up 
I would say yes to the panel's question. Has the West gone soft? Indeed, the West has not defended with the necessary energy the principles and values that 25 years ago led to the defeat of the communi communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think that one of the reasons for not defending properly the essential values of the free world lies in the ideologies that dominate our schools and our educational community. These ideologies turn our teaching into something that is falsely egalitarian. Furthermore, they disregard the transmission of knowledge that is the greatest asset of the Western civilization. And for this reason, any political project that seeks to recover a Western initiative in the world will necessarily have to undertake an in-depth review of the current teaching system. Before ending, I want to congratulate the Center of Political Studies for this for achieving this incredible conference, and of course, our sponsors. Thank you for your attention. Um, I, if you look at the clock, you will see we are now slightly over time. Let me just seek guidance. Are we going to get a vote on the question of has the West gone soft? Let me therefore move directly to that and ask you to vote on the question, has the West gone soft, yes or no? In, in, if Russia attacked Poland, would the West use military force to fight back? Well, that I think appears to be a sign that the West has not gone soft. Um, so um, uh, that's an optimistic note in which I have to end, um, even if I didn't wish to do so. And I certainly am sorry to bring to an end such a strong and effective discussion by such distinguished speakers. On your behalf, I'd like to thank them very warmly indeed and to say we're encouraged by this, even by the more pessimistic analyses we've heard. They've been splendid. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>